Okay, um, thank you for attending. Uh, I thought that we'd have a, a relatively small crowd today because uh, because of the time of the year, but this is great. Um, the speaker today is going to be Giuseppe Veltri from Trento. Uh, Giuseppe is going to be talking about the causal revolution uh, and how it relates, I think, to the to behavioral public policy and behavioral science in policy. Um, He's going to, as you, as most of you know, who attended the seminars this year, what we do these days is that the speaker just gives a couple of minutes or so uh, explaining how they got into behavioural science and behavioural public policy to begin with. And then we move on to the main presentation, uh, whereby they speak, for, as you know, for 15 minutes or so, and then we throw it out to questions and comments from, from your so thank you very much for agreeing to speak today, Giuseppe. I'm just going to hand over to you, and that's your brief. Introduce why you got into behavioural studies, and then you can move straight on to your main talk. Okay, then thanks, Adam. Thanks for having me. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe Meltre. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I work at the University of Trento in Italy. So how uh, did I get into behavioural economics or behavioural research in general? Well. I, I trained as a social psychologist, but um, for a long time I was uh, um, orbiting around the methodology department or institute at the LAC, where uh, during my PhD years I was uh, um, basically always there. Uh, so I, I was sort of uh, um, brought up as a social psychologist with a particular inclination of uh, looking into into the um, methodology and um and at that time I was very much into uh, what was called at that time public opinion analysis that was done you know uh, using a uh, several different type of methods from surveys to uh, quantitative analysis of of media content or or um uh, documents, uh, policy documents, and so on. And that's when uh, the sort of uh, more uh, uh, behavioral research uh, appeared in uh, in my radar. And uh, I, as I started to work also, I spent three years for um, the European Commission GRC. I worked three years for the European Commission GRC, which is the research branch of the European Commission. I started to read and learn about behavioral research with the idea that that was another way to, to design policy in a context where essentially, uh, I would say, traditional economists uh, were were dominating the the uh, the picture, and so uh, at the same time, I retain my sort of nature of personal interest in methodology. And these days, these days, I do a lot of computational social science. We use this label, probably something uh, about that will become clearer when I start to talk about uh, the, the topic of uh, today's talk. So that's, in a nutshell, the kind of journey, of course, there have been. Uh, so I'm a bit of an undisciplined social scientist, uh, but um, recently I, I really uh, very much focused on the intersection between computational social science and behavioral research, which I think there is a lot, particularly on this issue of um, uh, causal methods, which you know, we'll see in a second. That's it. <laughs> okay, so I'll uh, I'll put on the, my slides. Uh, so hopefully you can see them. Let me put them full screen. And maybe I can, let's see if it works, this new function of Okay, you should see me in the bottom corner like uh, an annoying uh, virtual assistant. <laughs> okay, um, so, oops, sorry, let me go back. I don't know why the slides moved to. Okay, so um, I'll start just saying that um, um, most of what I'm going to say is contained into a uh, a paper that just came out in a, a behavioral public policy. So a lot of details are in the paper, but here I will add something extra <clears throat> on something um, about the, the sort of new developments that I'm working on. So um, we, all of us, I guess, uh, encounter the issue of, um, uh, uh, say, um, critique, if you will, about 
the, the effectiveness of behavioral science, particularly the issue around the um, uh, effect, effectiveness of uh, behavioral intervention. And uh, this is one of the areas where I think um, the um, sort of more computational social science approach can help us. Um, in particular, in the case of heterogeneity of treatment effects, which is something that I guess all of us have encountered and discussed. There's, there have been several papers also in BPP about how we should you know, take in consideration more heterogeneity of treatment effects to explain either small effect size or uh, you know, some, some unexpected results. But uh, uh, I want to go one step further and then discuss a bit about these aspects of uh, the so-called causal revolution. Now, I know, of course, that revolution is a term that has been abused in, in, in many uh, uh, ways. But I truly believe that what, what happened in the past few years in uh, the way how we estimate causal effects and can think about causal relationship and causal modeling has had sort of major advancement. And I think we um, maybe you know we can benefit from um, combining some of this approach with what we normally do. So um, we talked about uh, this issue of effect size. Now I'm not among those persons that um, consider uh, uh, the overall picture in behavioral science in terms of effect size uh, of of behavioral interventions apocalyptic. I think you know there is a lot to discuss about that. Uh, comparisons are very difficult. And just, I think, yesterday, a <clears throat> paper came out came out about the role of behavioral science in, in into um, uh, designing intervention for COVID during the, the COVID pandemic, showing that basically uh, you know, a lot of stuff worked. And so um, uh, a lot of the concerns that have been raised in the past about uh, overestimating uh, the, 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 the really the capacity of uh, behavioral science to affect something um, where we're probably um, too, too apocalyptic. But if we really uh, condense the discussion in, in, um, in terms of uh, uh, um, the concerns uh, associated with effect size, there are really two issues that the, 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 you know, people have been discussing. One is the issue of treatment selections, which uh, we will come to that, you know, later on. So, uh, how can we be sure that the treatment we are using are effective, if uh, or or are the best options when you know we don't compare them with other treatments? Um, and you know, there is an answer to that. Uh, people are now referring to mega studies and so on. So, the idea of you know uh, trying to pit different type of uh, treatments one against each other. To, to select the, the best treatments. But the other one is, is the issue of heterogeneity where uh, essentially we, we stop at a level of very often average treatment effects. And that creates us a bit of an illusion of explanatory death because we determine a main effect, we determine the fact that it, uh, our treatment has worked or not, but basically we lose all the complexity related to this heterogeneity of treatment effects in our in our studies. And this is particularly true in a context where randomized controlled trials are now happening on a scale that was unearthed uh, just a few years ago. And not only that, that randomized controlled trials are being constructed in a way that you know tend to have high ecological validity, I external validity. So the idea that we call, we we pay so much attention to design this uh, randomized controlled trial, and then we stop at the level of analysis where we do uh, average treatment effects. It, it's a pity. It's a pity, and we we'll see uh, also that is a danger. Um, of course, people do some comparisons. Uh, you know, they might do simple comparison between groups in their treatment effects. Classical case is they do it with categorical uh, variable covariates like Democrats, Republicans, and so on. But there are problems in doing that. There are problems from a statistical perspective, but also uh, a problem uh, that uh, I call here the group selection problem. So 
simple comparisons are insufficient because we've encountered the problem that uh, somehow we are making the assumption that the behavioral heterogeneity that we are trying to uncover um, somehow uh, goes neatly into pre-established subgroups that we already have. This idea that you know we expect to see um, you know uh, important differences between Democrats and Republics, between Tories and, and Labour, or whatever you know other kind of typical categories we might use, and uh, and, and that's actually uh, um, a strong assumption because uh, we simply don't know which groups reveals the most heterogeneity. We, we just don't, and the point here is that. Uh, we want to find out. Now, we'll come at the end uh, to uh, discuss uh, how that could be an advantage, but also potentially a problem. But the point I'm making here is that the methods that I'm going to discuss in a few minutes allow us to overcome this problem because allow us to detect the groups based on this heterogeneity of treatment effects without having in mind already pre-established groups. So um, that's, a, that's a, a first important point. Um, now, obviously, this is not the time uh, and the place where I can discuss how computational social science, I think, is changing the way how we do analysis. But um, it's difficult to explain some of the methods that you can use, we, could, we, could, we could use for um, uh, exploring heterogeneous treatment effects um, without understanding that um, these sort of computational approaches are changing what often is referred as the modeling culture in the social science. Now, uh, this has been portrayed often in this sort of um, dichotomy of explanation versus predictions. So we do uh, uh, in the traditional data modeling culture that we use in social science, we construct models that they are easy to explain, where we place a lot of emphasis on the variables we select, but these models have very low predictive power. Okay, uh, It's easy to see that in a lot of, uh, let's say, sister disciplines like sociology, political science, where you find models that, you know, when they're really good, they they explain like 20% of the variance or whatever stuff they, they, are, they are using. But the reality is that actually these two things are not uh, one against each other. The relationship between explanation and prediction is actually much more uh, let's say nuanced than that. Um, people have been discussing that. I remember a 2014 paper by Duncan Watts basically saying, well, you cannot really do explanation without prediction in the social science. So there is a bit of a debate. Again, it's bit, in part technical, in part uh, almost, I would say, epistemological. But the point here is that these methods, these algorithmic methods like causal forest, which is the methods I'm going to discuss, they do have this component of using a lot of prediction and through prediction, essentially, allow you to explain things, okay? Again, uh, I do entire courses on this, so to summarize it in a few minutes is difficult, but again, I refer to, to, to my paper where there are both references and a bit, uh, you know, a, a bit more explanation. Um, so the idea here is that um, we, um, in terms of uh, exploring heterogeneity, we moved from relatively easy and completely data-driven approach of the classification of regression trees, which essentially is a way to um, show the conditional distribution of a variable of interest, usually our dependent variable, conditional to the values of a covariate. And that, that's, I mean, a fairly automatic process that doesn't really um, well, it, it can be useful, obviously, but it's entirely data-driven. Uh, this this uh, approach was further developed into uh, what is called the model-based recursive partition, in which I presented uh, a few years ago, well, two, year, two years ago, I guess, at the, at the first BPP conferences were in London, where the idea here is that you take a model and see how much this model holds true for different levels and combination of covariates in order to 
see if that model then behaves very differently for subgroups of, of individuals that they are characterized by those levels of uh, covariate uh, scores. And the next step of that has been causal trees, where essentially what you do is you take data from randomized control trials and you use these data to estimate heterogeneity based on covariates, but you also make the distinction of uh, estimating the, these differences on treated individuals and controlled uh, control uh, condition individuals, plus there are some additional, let's say, um, sort of robustness uh, steps you have to make. The further step is you do that not on one tree, but to a forest. You do it on, you essentially um, compute that on many, many, many trees. And then what you get essentially is a very robust uh, average estimate on many trees. But we'll come to that in a... So what is the logic of causal trees. The idea is, you know, really natural is that causal tree partition data into subgroups based on features. Features is the terms that, you know, machine learning people and computer scientists use to essentially say variables. In our case is covariates. So what we do is we identify variation in treatment effects um, based on these covariates. Now, hold in your mind that covariates now are playing an important role, and because we'll come to that. Uh, what the algorithm does is recursively splits the data in a tree format, and this tree format has nodes, and it does that in our, using a, a sort of split criteria that maximize differences in treatment effects between groups. Okay. And then it kind of uh, uh, estimate in each leaf, each branch of this tree, and compares the outcome of treated versus control units, in this case, people. Then in order to avoid overfitting, you do essentially some, some other steps, like cross-validation or in-sample estimation. Again, these are more technical stuff. But basically, you, you avoid overfitting, which is was one of the concerns that existed in previous version of these methods. Okay. Um, so this is about, okay, I put this in this slide just for the more, uh, let's say, uh, those who want to go in, in depth, because of course I can share these slides, but this is more formally how, how it works basically. And essentially what this, this, this does is that we compute individual treatment effects and based on how we can group individuals based on these individual treatment effects, then we can identify local treatment effects. And these local treatment effects will be identified conditional to the covariates that we have selected as important. So in other words, we are saying, go there and find based on the characteristics described by the covariates I've selected, differences in treatment effects in the study that I've done. Then of course there are other nuances into this, but that's in a nutshell. So it looks like something like that. Now, um, the interesting thing is that uh, this, this structure is hierarchical, meaning that the split on top is the biggest difference in treatment effects you can find between uh, a, a first group of people that characterized by one covariance. Here I named the covariance with not too much imagination, C3 and C2, covariate two and covariate three. So here in this example, which is the example of the simulation that I've done in, in the paper for BPP, you see that there is a first split here that divide uh, in, in, uh, in two groups. So the, you know 73% of the sample goes one way and 26.5 in another way. And so that means that not only you detect heterogeneity, but you see where this heterogeneity comes, because you can see at any level how there are further, further, uh, uh, let's say, um, sources of heterogeneity until you reach a point, so the terminal node, the bottom, where no further splits happen, okay? Now, you can adjust this. I mean, you can, you can put some rules and say, well, I'm only interested in splits that are generated where 
enough people, let's say 5% of the sample is retained in my, in my, uh, in one of those nodes, because for whatever reason, I'm not interested in, you know, in studying 4% of my sample group. Okay. So it looks like this. Yes, and and uh, this is a this is a one tree, okay. So that's a causal tree. What what the the causal forest does, and by the way, um, this is a little excursus. Uh, this is done with a so-called honest estimation. So the sample, uh, th this estimation is done splitting the sample so that not the same data to generate the leaves are used to compare the the, the estimates of the leaves. With the with the um, uh, the predictions, okay. Again, this is uh, uh, say a technical step you have to do to avoid overfitting. But uh, again, it's something that we can um, discuss later. The causal forest is simply applying uh, what people that have used that know as random forest, but for causal trees. Essentially, a random forest algorithm takes the prediction of many regression trees. In our case, it would be many causal trees, each trained on a bootstrap sample of the data, and then averages them together. So the idea here is that it does many causal trees so that uh, these the estimation of individual average treatments converge into a normal distribution so we have the true individual average treatment effect. Okay, it's a uh, you know it takes a bit to to imagine how that, that that happens, but but this is a sort of a kind of visual representation of how that kind of works. So in other words, because we have this additional level of randomness given by the fact that you have a, a lot of trees, that makes the estimation very robust. By the way, all this estimation is non-parametric. So we don't make no assumption about normality. And, and so the relationship between the covariates and our treatment effect can be of any kind, okay? This is what essentially I've done in, um, in, the, in the simulation in, in the paper, which I'll show you in a second. Now, if you compare this method to, with other methods to estimate uh, heterogeneity of treatment effects, for example, LASSO or post-selection OLS, we'll see that basically these three methods are perform very well, better. I mean, they're better capturing heterogeneity. On S3, which are another way to say castle tree, they do very well. Castle forest, just because, you know, they average many, many trees, they do even better. So it's a, it's a, it, they, they're basically very very good at term, identifying very very um, uh, let's say a small level of uh, of heterogeneity, and so this is a, a, the example the simulations that I I did for the BP paper where essentially what I did was I simulated a randomized control trial where we have a binary treatment, okay. And then we have free covariates, and these free covariates are one is normally distributed, C1, and the other two are not normally distributed using different type of non-normal distribution. And this is just an example of uh, um, the heterogeneity that will be present if you just ignore, uh, um, let's say, if you just compute an average treatment effect and you ignore what's going on there, because in this case, in the case of C1, you will see that there is a lot of uh, cases where the treatment effects become ne negative compared to um, uh, those that, that is positive. If you do the average, you know, you draw a line in sort of here, basically you will lose that. So that's the case where you have individuals that react in the opposite direction of what you want. Now, that sounds speculative, but actually we found this. Uh, um, for example, in the study we did with Matteo and others in the, the COVID uh, experiments. Uh, in the case of uh, C2, there's almost a threshold effect. You have a, you know some major effect uh, uh, for a certain value of the covariate C2, and then it becomes kind of flat. In For C covariate uh, C3, which is essentially a categorical sort of uh, covariate, you have a cluster. 
you know, some people will have a, a sort of fairly small effect and others, they will have a larger effect. So it becomes a cluster. You can, you can play this game, you know, uh, in different ways. This is what simulations are for. I mean, and, and this is what I did uh, with a continuous treatment um, uh, uh, variable and basically looking at additional uh, scenarios, so to speak. So these are all sorts of heterogeneity. You, you can see that there is a lot of heterogeneity that basically is flattened when you do the average treatment effect, okay? So, um, where all this uh, brings us. So the application. Now, this is entirely speculative. Okay? So this is uh, the area where we, we drop the, the methods and we're going to, okay, what is this is good for? And, you know, talking with the uh, people, the most they actually have encountered through the BPP network, um, my impression is that there are really two ways of using this type of analysis. The first one is when you are really, in the case A, where you're still understanding what's going on, okay? You are sort of trying to identify some behavioral determinants. And obviously, if you uh, analyze heterogeneity, it gives you feedback in updating your model, okay? Because you will see that if your behavioral model behaves very differently for some group of people determined by whatever covariates, then it means your model needs to be updated and revised. By the way, this is how it, it is used in, in sort of more bioecological research, nowadays genetics, and this sort of stuff. Um, the other one is the scenario we were discussing at the very beginning. So you do a treatment. It's a situation of a randomized controlled trial. You do a, a, a treatment. And then what, what happens is that you find these uh, local average treatment effects. And so you find those, I call them niches. Now, in order to call them niches, actually, you need to do a further step. So you need to have a clear idea why you have selected certain covariates and use them to identify this local edge of average treatment effect. And I think that bring, brings us to the point of the covariates. Now, I think in a lot of studies, and I'm the first to admit that was my case, uh, we just, when we did the data collection, we collected data then sort of throwing, uh, doing a randomized controlled trial and then just collecting the, the, the standard covariates, you know, the stuff you almost, they are sort of preset. Um, you know, education, lab, sort of generic political orientation or whatever, without really thinking too much, uh, how we, we could use that information. I think if, if you know that now you can exploit heterogeneity to this level of granularity, covariates should play a, a, a much bigger role. In particular, if you can find covariates, they are good descriptors of social ecological context, meaning of con contextuality, as you know, some people define it in, in the sort of behavioral domain of discussion. Then it means that when you will find this local average treatment effect, you, it means you're looking at the heterogeneous treatment effects conditional to context. And actually you can do a combination of uh, context and individual characteristics. And that I think would be very, in, very interesting. Now, all this modeling that I've talked about, it's, it's being applied massively in the private sector. So uh, when people do A-B testing, uh, which is you know uh, another way to say in industry, randomized control trial, now they, they, as they are very much interested in individual treatment effect, they do this type of modeling. And they also uh, moving to the point where they want to substitute A-B testing with something that I'll talk about in a second. So, but the point here, I think, is that uh, if you want to do um, an ecological use, I call it, of covariates, then I think giving some thought about what these covariates could be uh, would em empower you a lot in terms of uh, finding heterogeneous, heterogeneous treatment effects that they are informative also about context. 
But well, three, four more minutes, uh, Giuseppe. And then we'll... Yeah, I'm I'm wrapping up. Um, so the last point is that um, you know there is a lot going on in the causal estimation. Uh, there's something called causal machine learning that is happening, and the reality is that in social science we got a lot of observational data. Okay. Uh, sometimes ob observational data that is of very good quality. And combining that with experimental data always has been uh, uh, something that, you know, I thought could, could uh, we, could, we, we could do better. And one way of doing it is that uh, we now have very, very powerful way of inferring causal relationship in observational data. These are not perfect. Uh, example of these are the DAGs, direct, direct cyclic graphs, and ways of estimating that. Now we have algorithms that can test different type of, uh, of, of causal structure on the same data, essentially exploring all the possible causal relationship. These are called causal discovery algorithms. And the idea here is that they will find several causal structure and those could be tested in randomized control trials. So essentially, we could use observational data to learn about potential intervention, and, and that could inform us in terms of treatment selection. Because, and I'll give you an example of this in a second that I found in, 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 in my studies, uh, I mean, in one of my uh, uh, work in progress. But the idea here is that you, you can use um, also good quality observational data to infer causal relationship, which can, in, in, in turn can inform your behavioral intervention. Okay. So one example of this is that I was studying, this, this is the paper I presented uh, in, uh, in Chapel Hill, uh, uh, information avoidance about COVID information, okay? Now, I cannot do a randomized control trial there because everybody's been exposed to COVID. I mean, it's not that I can take people that don't know about COVID, okay? So what I did was, uh, these are um, in a slightly different graphical format, DAGs essentially, of um, uh, what happens in, in, in the output here is willingness to pay not to get uh, um, information about COVID. So willingness to avoid it, information about COVID, okay? So, uh, what I, I, I could find using this type of uh, modeling is that when you're worried, that has a positive effect on willingness to pay to avoid information about COVID. Meaning, if you're worried, you're willing to pay more to avoid information about COVID, worried about the, the overall COVID situation. But if you are scared, instead, you are willing to, um, uh, well, you will pay less, meaning, you will actually uh, want information. And this is done taking into consideration a number of confounder. So uh, your propensity for loss aversion in terms of information, your vaccine doses, you, if you are willing to get a future dose, your age and others, and some mediators. And all these are tested with some refutation methods, meaning you compare this with a, a random uh, uh, additional variable to see if the effect changes or not. I mean. These refutation methods are a bit complex to explain. But basically, this relationship holds true with all the refutation methods I could, I could uh, throw at them. Now, what that means? It means that in future, I could do an experiment, a randomized control trial, where I mean, manipulate these two levels of, of uh, emotional regulation, worried and scared, to see if that affects how people uh, avoid information about about COVID. So that, that's an example of how I could, you know, that could inform uh, um, an experiment. Uh, there are other options that are happening. Uh, causal clustering is, is a further development. Um, there are, I think, perhaps a bit more treatment effects using something called prediction rules and samples. I prefer causal force for a number of reasons, but there are Bayesian approaches, which again open up a different story there as well. Um, risks. Okay. So if we do this, that was going to be quick now, just have to, otherwise, we're going to run out of time. Questions. Okay. Just one minute. Uh, I think the risk here is that 
if you are very good at identifying local treatment effects, then the risk is that you might focus only on the people that are easy to treat. And that might have ethical implication. Uh, furthermore, you might identify groups based on these techniques, but these groups might not necessarily be policy actionable. Okay, So groups that you can target through policy instruments. So what might be the point there? And the last one is a bit... Uh, a bit of a further consideration is when causal estimation becomes very cheap, to treatment effect really becomes an optimization issue. So people, rather than testing different treatments, they will try to optimize it as much as they can because they can further refine it and refine it and refine it. And this is actually what is happening in high frequency so-called A-B testing. And I'll stop here. Uh, that's the paper. That's my email if you want to know more. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Giuseppe. If you could just bring your slides down as well. So just so I can see who's got their hands up. Okay. Great. Okay. So I think Yuval had his hand up first. So. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Really uh, innovative work. Um, so I think we, we talked about it in the, the first conference in London. And I want to, in a sense, uh, try to understand again, given your uh, presentation, especially when you focus on kind of sociological covariates and, and how it relates to the heterogeneity, and ask specifically about three factors, at least I'm trying to to study and understand. One is, is, is the effect of culture. So if an intervention worked in one country, the likelihood of it working in a different country across domain. So let's say it worked in tax, the likelihood is going to work in environmental behavior. And third, non-behavioral factors. So things that you know legal scholars care about will be institutions, rule of law, legitimacy, stuff like that. Uh, in your, you, do you see your approach as helping researchers uh, advance their understanding of the ability of efficacy of one intervention across the dimensions I mentioned by using all of them as what you call sociological uh, covariates? That's you think captures all of it, or you see a difference between them? Um, well, in, in short, the answer is yes, because my my first application of these techniques was exactly using that, that kind of type of, uh, of uh, sort of covariates that you were mentioning, um, uh, particularly in the context of uh, European wide research, as I've been working, uh, countries usually obviously. Um, but the interesting thing there is that you find, um, um, again, uh, you determine, so to speak, the play field of these covariates, but then the groups uh, can surprise you. And what I found in the COVID context was that actually you would find uh, people across countries with very different, uh, with very similar reaction to certain interventions. So country wasn't really the, the relevant dimension. And to a certain extent, of course, we know that within country, heterogeneity is huge. So not terribly surprising there. Uh, but the other ones are more interesting because the cultural ones, then the the, the question is how, how you uh, measure those, those sort of covariates and then you put it in, into the picture. And also, I think the institutional one is a very good one. It's... Uh, it's, a, it's I think it's potentially because then what you can also test is as these methods allow is the interaction between those covariates. So you might have you know certain institutional settings, certain culture, certain type of effects differential in terms of treatment effects. So yeah, definitely it can be useful in that respect. Yes. Al. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Giuseppe. Really, really interesting, really exciting uh, talk and, and paper. I'm very interested in um, pro heterogeneity, mostly for the uses of trying to personalize behavioral interventions based on that heterogeneity. So this is really, really, really helpful. So I have two questions, if that's okay. One, um, does this method, can, can this method be used uh, as is on existing data, like if there's already uh, research that has these uh, both the uh, X and Y and co-founders and um, covariates, 
can you just apply that on existing data or is there are there any kind of restrictions in terms of the type of data that you need to use or the way the data is structured, et cetera. I'll be very interesting to know. The second question is more about kind of a clarification. When you say these are causal trees, these are causal models, um, at the end, correct me if I'm wrong, at the end, we're basically talking about correlations between, between variables. We haven't manipulated any of the covariates and we can't as, as in your example. So does the, the, the jump, the leap from correlation to causation happens because you can validate that model or is there anything else uh, uh, that, or, or, or are we still talking about correlation? Uh, okay, uh, the first question is, yes, they can be used on existing data. I think the, the really, to me, the, the, the sort of caveat is that these are really methods uh, applicable to studies that they have uh, the fairly large. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense to do it on an experiment with 100 people because <laughs> you end up with, you know, uh, estimation of, uh, of you know, groups of two people or something like that. Um, th the second is that, um, no, when, uh, when the causal trees uh, are built, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not really correlation. Those are conditions probabilities of the fact that you have a certain level of treatment effect due to a certain having a certain level of one or more covariates so and that is used to do a prediction on that's the honest estimation point so no those, those are causal estimates those are not correlation okay and using randomized control trial data okay that's uh, that's because there are some assumption about obviously independence and uh, a number of assumptions. Uh, it's a different story when we talk about the DAGs, the last part, I mean, the last slides, based on observational data. Those are causal, but, you know, um, I mean, to me, are, but but there are a number of caveats there, OK? So there are because there are several causal estimation you can make on the same observational data which is not the case with the randomized control trial, okay? So um, that's uh, the main difference. Um, and by the way, I mean, you know, there's a school of thought like Julius Pearl that, you know, when correlation is embedded in a certain way of modeling actually is a proxy of causation. So, you know, it's a, it's a controversial issue, yes. Cool. Uh Hi, uh, Giuseppe. Thank you very much for uh, a very clear presentation. I was asking myself, you know, what sort of the user cases for these models are. Um, <laughs> and bear with me as I explain that they seem to be useful, particularly for commercial entities when they're fine tuning. So what I mm -hmm. mean by that is that as we're treatment effects are part of a much larger trajectory that leads to decision making. There's, there's the cost of gathering data. There is the consideration that people can cheat on the signals they give. Um, there's also how quickly does the environment change and how difficult it is to analyze these things or reform the eventual production process. So if I'm thinking of these kind of methods, I'm, I'm thinking of a quite quickly reactive environment where you can quickly do a lot of new experiments and whereby you have a strong incentive to learn quickly. And then I'm thinking of well, let's say hotel chains with lots of different people coming to stay. So fairly defined environments in which, yeah, you do want to fine tune, you know, are the, um, are the handkerchiefs going to be red or blue or white? And does that differ over people? Do you, do you offer them a scuba diving course or a tennis course? And then to whom and where? Um, and similarly for these kind of very personalized services that you may have. And if I'm thinking of government services, maybe child mental health, but there you will often have several years of, of, of sort of delay between identifying something that works and implementing it. And it's, it's very difficult to fine tune because cost and organization are, are often much more important than, you know, the precise difference between supposed treatment effects. So I would, I would guess, uh, and I would like to hear from you whether this is true, that really the, this, the market for this kind of thing is highly commercial and personalized services, or 
Have I have I missed the beat there? Uh, no, no, no. It's a it's a it's a good point. I think I think the application in um, uh, is true that if you if you think about the sort of in, individual treatment effects type of estimation, definitely the commercial is where you know the the, the advantage is. I would add ELF, to be honest, because the issue of personalized medicine in some cases, not all, could be also another one. But I think in the context more broad of, let's say, public policy, you don't need to go to the level of individual um, um, uh, treatment effect. I think the local treatment effect, so the, at the group level, the subgroup level, it's good enough for you because that's where you want to intervene. So. The case we had about the COVID study we did uh, uh, some time ago was that you know messages uh, meant to promote uh, vaccine uptake backfired with subgroups that were fairly easy to identify with these methods, and so you want to go there and understand why these guys actually uh, are doing the opposite of what we hope they would do, and um, so when you know that also uh, going in the opposite direction has also a very caught. It's a very costly thing to have in a public policy intervention, and subgroups can be identified uh, if they go in that direction. I think that's the, the something you, you you could use it. So, thank thanks, you. thanks, uh, Raghu. I should say uh, Raghu is a professor at Goldsmiths, but he got his PhD from Trento, um, Giuseppe, and he shares similar interests. Right. I think he shares similar interests with you, so you might want to touch base afterwards. But Raghu, over, over to you. That's, uh, that's very kind, Adam. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Giuseppe. It was a very interesting presentation. I, I was uh, going to ask you to reflect on some things that you touched upon. For instance, you spoke about heterogeneous treatment effects, which are quite interesting. But there is also, you spoke about causal mediation, which are path-specific effects. So one, you're focusing on mechanism. The other one is focusing on low. I mean, we understand that um, average treatment effects lump everything. You want to have more fine granular understanding of things. But <clears throat> to me, I think reflecting also on some of the questions uh, posed earlier, the real sort of uh, breakthrough would be to combine these two, which is basically you have mediation effects on one hand, which tells you, because at the end of the day, you're interested in causal mechanisms rather than just causal effects. So if we want to go down to the bottom of that, so I, I mean, I have a way of thinking about it, but I'm not sure uh, whether it's, it's. Uh, but I would like to know your thoughts on how you can, on the one hand, combine the path-specific effects, not just necessarily in the same way as, let's say, Pearl and all people think about it, but uh, still within the potential frameworks you can think about uh, and also the heterogeneous treatment effects, if that's sensible at all to think about. No, no, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, in fact, I mean, I, I, I didn't man mention it in this talk because I mean the focus was on heterogeneity. But I think you know the idea that um, this is coming from all the new causal modeling, where it's not only about mediators. You have colliders. You have all this different way of thinking about, um, let's say, interactions in the sort of causal path between, and those. I mean. We do model now that with observational data because um, it's, it's basically easier. People are trying to combine that also with the with the RCT data in this. So it is actually something that is happening. Uh, so it, it it's it's not easy to do. <laughs> it's not easy to implement uh, because every time you add a layer of the composition of data, then well. Uh, it, it basically creates some some issues, but um, yes, definitely that's one of the of the point of not only looking at the heterogeneity, but then looking at having some kind of uh, um, uh, sort of representation of the casual network of relationship between both the covariates. And, but again, there means to attribute covariates different type of roles as a mediator, as a potential collider, as a and so on. Great. Okay, uh, Alejandro. Yeah. Um, quick thing and some thoughts about this. Uh, the uh, Nancy Carwright mentions that uh, randomized controlled trials can tell you that the treatment A will lead you to to the effect B. 
But uh, she argues that in order to understand if the treatment will work in different settings and even in the same setting in the future, you have to understand the causal mechanism. And that's something that Raoul already mentioned. And this causal mechanism starts as a hypothesis. Could it be that your causal forest uh, may be a way to verify the hypothesis that the scientists have in order to understand the actual causal mechanism, the reason why the treatment would work? And can we use those causal forests to, to verify and adapt the hypothesis of the causal mechanism? Hmm. <laughs> um... <laughs> That, that's a very profound question, uh, Alejandro. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think I have an answer, a uh, straightforward answer. Um, I think it could. It could. Uh, I, I only assume that uh, revealing heterogeneity at a different level will help you to, to understand why A produced the effect B and in what condition it doesn't and so on. So in a way, it reveals part of the sort of causal path, okay? And on the other end, you have these other methods that I mentioned before where you state, you know, uh, well, that there are essentially this uh, causal discovery algorithm that basically go there and test all the possible uh, sort of causal path between uh, um, your predictor and potential uh, in your data set. So, Again, there is a there is a point of convergence there, but I don't think it exists yet. Um, that's you know work for the future, I suppose. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thank I, I can see it. I can see it happening. I mean, I can see the, the this double feedback uh, going back and forth uh, and yeah. uh, updating the hypothesis. Like, okay, I think this works because it happens this way, and now you see the the results uh, of. Of the of the castle forest, and then you go back to the hypothesis, like okay, maybe this mechanism has this different. Uh, yeah. I don't know, especially when you can understand like there are like, different settings, different countries, different uh, sociolo sociological issues involved. I don't know. Thank you so much, Giuseppe. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Raghu, you want to come back in again? Yeah, I just wanted to, if that's okay, to come yeah, yeah, in. Like, yeah, we've got nobody else with a hand up at the minute, and we've got a few minutes left. So. Okay, it, to come back to Alejandro's point on. So I think essentially what you're asking, if I'm not mistaken, is about hypothesis generation, which is like abductive process of taking. So I think depending on whether you're looking at Pearson way or other way, I think Sendhil Mulanathan's work on machine learning and combining with hypothesis generation really touches on some of the points that you're making. Maybe it's some place to look at. I don't think they look at causal forests as the only way, but broadly as predictive techniques that would just feed back into explanatory models and then sort of that virtuous cycle, how do you select that? That's right. Does anybody want to follow up or have another question? We have a couple of minutes left if anybody's got anything pressing. Um, are you online still, Rory? I didn't know whether you wanted to say anything about the advertising world in this context, about whether... Uh, it's no, suffice to say, I'm, I'm obviously fascinated by this because there has been work done and I'll connect you with the people who've done it uh, by colleagues of mine in the United States, specifically around vaccine hesitancy. And um, uh, there's also some work in the market research industry about this, about how effectively um, uh, there's absolutely anything but homogeneity uh, in the field of vaccine hesitancy. What's possibly worse, too, was the stereotypical view that people acquired of who would be vaccine hesitant um, was often... Um, well, actually, just diametrically wrong. So I'll ob I'll obviously be um, sharing the recording if I with, with my colleagues in the US. But this has far far wider uh, uh, applications as well. There are lots and lots of things where there are going to be subgroups whose principal motivation, in other words, the causation behind their behaviour, generally lies outside what are considered to be the standard variables which we look at. So no, I'm very very interested indeed. Okay. Thanks, Rory. Yeah, I mean these these videos are publicly available, and they're you know um, they're put on YouTube and on the LSE website. So please feel free to share uh, if you wish. Giuseppe, did you want to come back with any final comment that you might want to make today? Um, um no, no. I, again, just uh, drop me an email if you if you want to be in touch. I mean, I, I'm very open. I mean, I'm uh, engaging also with the community that advocate the use of uh, ABM. You know, in um, 
in uh, in behavioral because I think uh, uh, there is also a connection there. Um, and uh, you know, I I think uh, this this um, sort of well, intersection between computational social science and behavioral research, I think it's very promising. I mean, the, um, I, I really encourage to have a look at, you know, what's happening there, because uh, particularly for us, for, for people that want to do uh, public interventions, I think, you know, uh, we need to have a, a sort of more sophisticated way of analyzing these really precious data that we collect. I mean, uh, that's uh, uh, that's a given, really. So yeah, um, I'll stop here. I mean, we we all, I guess, all of us. Uh, I mean, Adam, you you get me in the weakest moment for an Italian lunch. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not at my, at my best. <laughs> yeah. no, it was great. It was it was, it was it was great. Thank you very much for leading today's uh, discussion, Giuseppe. Um, the next, uh, the next seminar in this series, is, as you all can guess, is next month, um, in the latter part of next month on a Thursday, going back to the normal time of 1 till 2 p.m. I think it's Paul Freiters, but I don't have my, I don't have my uh, program in front of me, but I think it's Paul who's presenting the next time. I want to thank you all for turning up today. I know that it's, um, you know, as Giuseppe says, it's not only lunch, but it's you know, getting close, well, for academics at least, it's getting close to Christmas, it seems. And a lot of them are sort of drifting away now. Um, so thank you all for attending. And uh, I wish you all a, a very happy uh, holiday season. See, I'll see you all next year. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.